I'm back in plenary session, and I'm joined via Zoom by Dr. Michael Brettauer. Professor Brettauer is a professor of medicine, gastroenterology at the University of Oslo, Norway. He is also the first author of the Nordic study, the randomized controlled trial of colonoscopy, the first ever randomized trial of colonoscopy as colon cancer screening. And it is a pleasure to speak with him this morning. Coming from Oslo, are you in Oslo, sir? I am in Oslo. It's Friday afternoon over here. Thank Good you so much here. for doing this. Problem. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about, I think, um, I had the chance to read your paper, and I think it's uh, an important and superb contribution to the literature. I also had a chance to read your back catalog. I worked my way through some of your editorials and publications over the last few years, and I must say, I feel very aligned with you. I feel like we think similarly, and I think the reason is that we have a similar core philosophy, which is evidence-based medicine, and if you have that sure. philosophy and you take it to its conclusion, you will come to these kinds of points of view. So I wonder if we might start first with the United States Preventive Services Task Force decision a few years ago. You have written uh, a brilliant editorial in the Annals of Internal Medicine, of which you're an associate editor, um, discussing the USPSTF's decision to issue the following recommendation. Now, they could have said, we recommend you do one of the two things that have randomized trial data supporting reduction in colorectal cancer death, but instead they recommended you can do anything you want for colorectal cancer screening, FOBT, FIT, sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy plus FIT, and even CT screening, CT colonography. And you have tackled this in an Annals of Internal Medicine paper. I wonder if you might explain to listeners what your argument is. Yeah, for this at, this at the time it was, and I think we, we titled the piece, We Are Confused. America, We Are Confused, I think we wrote, which yeah. was of course a provocative title, but but it I think it worked because we were really confused when the task force came with those recommendations because we and we as me and my co-authors at the time, all are people from Europe who are in the field of cancer screening and colorectal cancer screening, we... Um, for us, there has been and still is, I guess, a hierarchy. And the hierarchy of screening tests is according to the evidence, uh, which is available for the different tests. And as you have elaborated in your podcast before, there is a big difference in the quality of the evidence for the different corrective cancer screening tests that you just mentioned. And then the task force said, well, you know, any test will work. The best test is the best is the test that gets shut down in all those uh, headlines. And we didn't understand it. We didn't understand the, the line of arguments. We we understand that in order to get an effect of something, you need to do the intervention. That's logical and that's applicable to everything in medicine or life even. Um, however, from from that step to saying, well, you know, everything works, just, just pick one of them and then you'll be okay. That's a very big step, which we didn't think was supported by by the evidence. I think that's well put. And the way I kind of describe it to people is by making that recommendation, it's possible that there's somebody out there who would not have done FOBT or FIT, and they would not have done sigmoidoscopy, and they choose to get a CT colonography. And it's possible that's better than doing nothing. But it's also possible right. there's someone out there who would have done flex sig, and they instead get CT colonography. And it's also possible CT colonography doesn't actually work. We don't know. There's no randomized data. So it's possible their recommendation actually erodes, I think, the best medical practice rather than enhances. Would yes. you agree? I, I agree with you. And that's like when it comes to the internal comparison of the different tests. But there is a, there's another layer to it. Yeah. And, 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 and that is that so if the benefits are largely unknown and the benefits are largely unknown for some of the tests that TARFOS recommends, for example, for CT clonography. However, there are um, potential harms, and we know that there are potential harms, and there is, there's everything from procedure-related harms, adverse events, complications, complications of the follow-up, of course, complications of, of you know, removing a polyp or, or a small cancer, uh, then leads to overdiagnosis, overtreatment, all that, all these things are known potential harms of, mm. of these tests and cancer screening tests um, in, in, in general. Now, the benefit is unknown, the harms are there, where does that leave us with regards to that balance between benefits and harms? We would like to know, or as a patient, I would like to know that balance before I make my decision. If that balance is unknown, I cannot really make a, a conscious decision. 
You know, another analogy I think of is in heart failure, there's a couple of beta blockers that have shown mortality benefit. The cardiologists always recommend those and use those. They don't say you can pick any beta blocker. And so when you do have good evidence, it doesn't make sense to me that you would actually, uh, as a policy, recommend things for which you don't have good evidence because you want to channel people to the things you know work. Is it possible that, you know, a new beta blocker will work? Sure, but we haven't proven that yet. So why would you usurp the market share of Coreg or Metoprolol XL? I agree. I agree. And then there's one other thing that I just 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 thought about when you were talking. Uh, I, I agree. And that is what about the research agenda in the years after the guideline the guidelines come out with such a statement? Well, I think it will be more difficult for people who actually would like to do the randomized trials that we have for some of the tests like FOBT or Flexig, for other ones where we didn't have them, let's just as CT colonography or even colonoscopy, which we have done over here. But in, in, in the US, I think it gets difficult for people to do randomized trial with a no screening group and then a test which task force recommends because many people would say well you know there's guidelines out there that say this is great just do it and then you get in trouble with your IRB I don't think that's how we would like to set up advancement in medicine you know that's a really excellent point and we can come back to that but yes certainly allowing practices without evidence actually subverts equipoise to do the proper studies and I think we've seen that exactly over and over. yeah exactly yeah to your point, I guess one thing I want to get straight in the listener's mind is um, if you might describe just for a moment what your uh, clinical and research practice is. And forgive me if I look over here a little bit because that's where one of my other cameras is. Um, so, you know, you're a practicing gastroenterologist. You do these procedures. You know how to go in. You know how to get to the cecum and come back out. Um, some people think that's really important that they hear from somebody who's doing it. Um, but you're also an epidemiologist. You're also a health services researcher. I wonder if you might talk about the hats you wear. And you're also a trialist, and you've run the first and only randomized controlled trial colonoscopy to date. Um, so I wonder if you might talk a little bit about the hats you wear. Oh, sure. So, so uh, I, I still consider myself as a clinician, as a gastroenterologist, um, uh, somebody who treats patients, although, and I've done that for many years full time, you know, I've, I've practiced internal medicine, then specialized in gastroenterology, have done endoscopy for full time, or almost full time for uh, many years, 15 years about that. So I, I was one of those people who, who you know, went up and down to the cecum and did all that stuff that, that people do who, yeah. who, who do endoscopy. Um, and I still do it one day a week and I like to do it. I like to be, I like to see the patients and I also like to do the procedures. Uh, so it's something that, that I am interested in and I like to do. However, with my other hat, which, which in, in recent years is more and more prominent in my life, the researcher hat and, and, and the trialist hat and the epidemiologist hat, which are, which are very closely related to each other. In that role, I, which I, for myself is a more important role um, uh, the last 10 years, because it gives me more a bird's view perspective of things, putting things into, uh, into, into perspective, um, getting out of the colon into, you know, bigger things than the colon. Um, uh, I think for myself, that's more important and for, the people around me, society, I think I can do a better job there. I think uh, many people can do endoscopy. They do it great. I was good at it, but many other people are good at it too, and maybe even better than, than me now. But that other function, I think, is more important for me to pursue. Now, in that function, and I chose this background screen that, that people are seeing here, in that function, it is very important, I think, to... Um, be able to maintain a distance towards your research topic. So let's say with the trial for colonoscopy screening that we did, certainly we set up this trial because there was some belief that this would be a beneficial procedure. If you do not have any belief that this would bring anything, you shouldn't do a trial. We started the trial because we thought, you know, there may, there may be something in here. However, I think you should not be a believer of, for example, colonoscopy. If you are a believer, if you are if you are a an enthusiast, you lose that distance to a research topic, and then it becomes muddled with um, with uh, between enthusiasm and and the healthy distance you have to have as a researcher. Therefore, this this is a German word here, uh, Zweifel, which means doubt uh, in in English. Therefore, I think it's important when you have that head on that you always are distant from, from your topic. So to be able to 
be objective as objective as you can throughout your study until today when we published it. You know, that's really well put, and I could not agree with you more. And I think that one of the reasons why the reception to your study in Europe and the reception in America is very different is that we have more emotional attachment to colonoscopy in America. We've been doing it for 25 years, and it's been making many of us rich, and it has created a very lucrative specialty. Here, gastroenterology is one of the highest paying fields, and it's in part, or perhaps even predominantly so because of colonoscopy, it's the high, it's because it's so high paying for so many years and because the procedures, I think many people find them enjoyable to do as a, as a practitioner, uh, mm. it gets the best. I mean, literally the best and brightest go into GI. Um, yeah. and, and so I think we have to acknowledge that because when I started in medicine, I think we still had a culture where what it meant to be a good scientist was dispassion and distance from your topic. I'm not wedded to, as a chemotherapist to any chemotherapy that allows me to see, I think, clearly. Right. But I do think in the last five years, particularly, there's more of a movement in medicine where doctors see themselves as scientists and advocates. It's not just science, but we're not just colonoscopy saves lives and we got to get it out there. And the more you wear your advocacy hat, the more you, you lose the vision, the perspective. You do. That, yeah. And I think that yeah. they, it's, a, it's a mistake that some of us have to be scientists. Some of us can be advocates. But it's hard to do both. It is very hard. It's almost impossible to do both. Uh, and it's also, it gets very personal. You know, you have, as you say, you have your income and your income is related to what you do. And if somebody takes that away, that's not nice. You have all your friends in that environment and they're all the same and they think the same uh, thoughts and they are all enthusiasts. So it's, it's getting very personal and when it's get, getting very personal. It's very difficult to keep that distance, which is so important. Okay, so let's get into the study now. So Nordic randomized control trial, 84,000 participants, randomized registry-based, pragmatic. A um, lot of very elegant things about it. Uh, you exclude people who've had colonoscopy at baseline. You send invitations out. You get a 42% compliance rate. It varies between Poland, where they're very skittish. They seem like they don't want to do it. And Norway, where 60% of people do participate. Um, and in the control arm, of course, the beauty of your study is by picking the ages you've picked and the places you've picked, you have absolutely minimized contamination of the control arm. I think if you had had even a little bit of contamination of the control arm, people would, you know, beat you over the head with that. So I wonder yes, if you might talk a little bit about the design choice, um, why you pick these places, how you're actually setting it up, and, why, and how you're minimizing contamination of the control arm. Yes. So we can first about uh, talk first about the trial design, and we had actually a lot of discussion about that 15 years ago when we when we set up the protocol uh, in this group of people here over here in Europe, because there was one there was one part of the group who wanted to do a pragmatic trial, which we ultimately did. Just as you explained, we invited virtually everybody who lived in the cities where we did the trial. Everybody in that age group, 55 to 64 years. Um, we, the only people we excluded that were the people who had colorectal cancer before or who were dead, obviously. Uh, but everybody else was randomized. Um, but Michael, you would exclude is... somebody if, if, if I had had hemorrhoidal bleeding and I had a colonoscopy in the year before, I wouldn't be invited to the screening. You would. I well, would be. Okay. Yes. Oh. Uh, so, so we randomized everybody. Okay. See, okay. that's the first thing. Okay. We randomized everybody regardless if they had a colonoscopy yesterday or never. Okay, okay. We only on. we only excluded the people who had who had a colorectal cancer before gotcha. because we Understood. knew that okay. from from the cancer registry, and obviously the people who, who who were dead. There were some people who died between randomization and then the study started. They, they, those people we excluded from the analysis, but everybody okay. else was randomized. Now, the people who were then randomized to the screening group and got the letter. Uh, with the invitation for the colonoscopy, we then said in the letter, look, if you just had a colonoscopy, call us and we can discuss. Some people had it. You have to remember in the trial areas, there was no screening. And the large bulk of colonoscopies, for example, in the US today is done for screening. We only, we didn't have that huge activity. We only had the clinical colonoscopies that people do every time for symptoms. Right. So, so we, we told them, if you just had one, you're uncertain if you would like to participate in the trial, call us. And then we discussed with them. And if they just had one, especially in the last year, we, um, we for some of those folks, not many, for some of those folks, we, we, um, we looked at that colonoscopy report. And if um, it was a 
it was a good colonoscopy. There was nothing there. We told them, look, you can come back if you like, but you just had one. It looked good. It was a good quality colonoscopy. Maybe you, sh- you, you know, you should not attend. But this, these people were very, very few. I see. Okay. Um, I, I just want to add one thing here to this. Some some people say that um, you know uh, you shouldn't allow diagnostic colonoscopy on the control arm. That's absolutely crazy. Okay, I just want to point that crazy. out to listeners. It's absolutely crazy because the question you're asking is: Should governments invest in a screening program beyond usual medical care? Not exactly. by stabbing someone in the heart in the control. I mean, you can't punish people, you know, and make it worse than usual medical care. Okay, I just want to point that out. Yes, diagnostic colos need to exist. The more men are comfortable saying my stools are shrinking in caliber and I have blood in my stool, that will hurt your screening program as it ought to because that's the way yes. secular trend. Okay, all right, sorry. Go back to your study. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the diagnostic colonoscopies there were, they were, ro- they were rolling all through the study as, sure. the, if you will, the background noise in both groups. And we also said to people, look, both to the people who showed up, but also to the people in who didn't show up in the intervention, room, look, if you develop symptoms, of course, see your doctor and you get a colonoscopy yeah. if your doctor thinks that's a good idea. Uh, that's very important. So where to do the trial? Well, one of the things, you know, back to the uh, trial design, so pragmatic, or some people argued for, well, let's do it like some of the other screening studies have done. Uh, first, ask people if they're interested to participate in a trial, and yes, then randomized, which yeah. obviously would have given us a much higher participation rate. Uh, but we didn't want that. We were interested in that population effect of screening. And we were also quite confident that we'll be, we, we would get a reasonably high participation rate think we have i mean 42 percent and i think you talked about it in one of your last podcasts 42 percent is actually i think it's high it's not low yeah. but it's high and and in norway it's it's actually very high with 60. i mean that's um that's not not many cities or areas in the world have 60 percent if you just ask everybody to come for an can invasive I just, procedure can i just push on that a little bit and also mm-hmm. listeners should know your power calculation is powered for 50 percent not doing it it is Okay, so you're already very close to that. And then the second thing I want to point out to listeners is people keep touting in the United States we're at 60 whatever percent. That's inaccurate. That is a self-reported questionnaire asking people who returned your questionnaire, are you, quote, up to date with CRC screening? That is not the same thing as the number of actual people who are actually doing colonoscopy. They're very different because, one, people who don't give a F, they're not going to fill out the form. Two, the people, we want to please doctors. So I'll tell you, you ask me, am I up to date on going to the dentist? The answer is yes. You really ask me over drinks. The answer is the truth, which is <laughs> I don't go to the dentist. Okay, you know, so this, this is not an accurate statistic. Yeah. Okay, so back to your point. So no. your point, I think 42 is good. It's very good. I think it's very good. And I think it's, as you said, it's very close to what we expected. So this yeah. is, we are right on target. Yeah. Uh, that's what we powered the trial for. In terms of where we were with the, with the trial, we, we uh, certainly looked at many locations in Europe. Um, very important for us, number one. There's people uh, who we could work with who have the infrastructure to pull this off. This has been difficult to do. Um, uh, number two, um, no screening program. That was very, very important to keep that contamination very low in the control group. And, you know, this is now a 10 year trial, will be a 15 year trial. I mean, nobody can promise, well, you know, I'm going to keep my control group clean for 15 years, but they, they, when we started, we said that you, should have, you shouldn't have any plan to start screening in your city or your area. Mm, that, wow. was like the, that was like the ticket into the trial for the wow. people. Um, and, and then the third thing, which is very important, high quality colonoscopies, because that quality varies between people and centers and cities and countries. Um, so that was actually my, my job uh, in the first years I spent much of my time to travel around at the centers, um, looking at the colonoscopies, training people to do better, pointing out, okay, now you have to do this, now you have to do that. Um, So I was out there all the time to make sure that we had a high quality of all the procedures that we were doing. And let's talk about that just for a moment, which is that this is something that's been discussed a little bit. Um, There are different metrics of quality for colonoscopy. Um, My understanding is, one, the number of times you actually get to the cecum. Number two, how much time it takes to withdraw. Number three, the adenoma detection rate. Um, What metrics were you looking and uh, uh, what metrics were you looking at? And and what did you do to sort of optimize that? Yes. So the metrics are as described by you. So there's bowel preparation quality. 
Um, and we have a very, very high quality, which is in the table table one of the paper. Uh, more than 90% of people had good or very good well, uh, prep quality. Number two is uh, if you come up to the cecum, you know, the, which is a complete examination of the colon, and that is important, of course. It was 96% in the trial, which is very good. And number three is, do people find what they're supposed to find, which is, of course, some cancers, but cancer is not really the interesting thing here, uh, but it's adenoma, so, so precancerous lesions. And so we, we, we monitored very closely the adenoma detection rate of all the endoscopists who were involved. There, were, there, is, there was variation, as you would expect, it's always variation, but, um, but um, the vast majority of the people were above the threshold uh, we had and which is recommended. There were some that, that were below, however, uh, and, and that has been pointed out by some of the colleagues in the last days after the study appeared in the Union Journal. There's one country in the trial, Sweden, where the colorectal cancer incidence is lower than in the other countries. Mm. And, and it's, it's quite significantly lower. Nobody knows why, but it's just, it, that's just the fact. These folks over in Sweden had a lower ADR or a number detection rate. I think, and I, I, you know, I was around there. I don't think their quality was bad at all, but there were just fewer adenomas. And I think that's a reflection of the lower risk for the population of Sweden. Um, um, and therefore, you know, the adenoma prevalence is just lower because folks have a lower CRC risk. Um, it's, not, it's not a quality issue. It was not a quality issue. And the only thing I'll add to your, your points, which are superb, Maybe it's the lingonberries. Um, it's that uh, <laughs> um, people were people are comparing the adenoma detection rate in your study, which ran between 2009 and 2014, against very select adenoma detection rates reported from the United States in the last couple of years. Here's a few of the things that are different. One, we're not comparing the same time points. And by the way, I've tried to do this since you're, since I've read this. Two, the United States has had colonoscopy for quite some time and many hospitals have seized upon ADR as a benchmark of quality and they tell the doctor ADR, ADR, ADR. And the moment you start to incentivize people for it, the moment you start to flog people, give them reports and show them what it is, you're going to change that statistic. Um, even if the colonoscopy is done the same way they would do it before, you're going to change this, the way they document, the way they snare, the way they bill, the way they report. Um, and yeah. so, so I looked back so some, I think your editorialist actually cites uh, data from Kaiser Permanente, a very small study in a very controlled setting that really isn't a representative population because they're only getting people rich enough to have their insurance, which is one caveat. Uh, I looked back at a broader registry in the United States. I went back to 2014. I couldn't even go back to 2009. I can't even find that data. Um, but year over year, it goes up. So that's one fact. It's going up by year because, you know, we're telling people to get that number higher. Yes. Um, and if you go back and you sort of look at the mean and, and plot a normal distribution and compare it to your study, it's actually very, I mean, it's not that dissimilar. It's much closer than what people think. United States ADR, what you all did comparing year to year apples to apples. I think it's, it's very close. Any thoughts on this? Oh, I totally agree. And I also, I, I, I was a little puzzled by that argument by some of my friends in the US the last days, because I thought, man, what are you talking about? This is very good. 30%, yeah. Sweden has another, uh, we talked about that, but for the other countries, 30% is very good. So I, I totally agree with everything, everything you said. One additional point, um, I don't think there is a linear relationship between ADR and cancer risk, uh, which goes all the way up to 100% ADR. And Doc Cawley, uh, 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 a gastroenterologist at yeah. Kaiser, yeah. where you are in San Francisco, yeah. he yeah. published, he and his group published in JAMA this summer, uh, a, a nice, very large study about the relationship between ADR and cancer risk, where you can see that that association, if you will, levels out at levels above 35 percent i see so 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 higher if you go higher if you go to 40 50 60 70 there's not much gain anymore the problem is the the low performance the people who are low though are five six seven percent these folks we have to get better if you do you know 35 or 38 or 39 doesn't really matter and and that's a really broad point about, I think, the flat of a curve, that often you get a lot of benefit by moving the worst performers up to the middle, and from yes. middle to the top and top to the perfection, diminishing returns. The other yes. thing I would point out is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
my reading of it is, is that ADR, interval cancer, there are associations present, as one might expect, quality and interval cancer risk. But to my mind, no one has ever proven um, that, you know, flogging a bunch of doctors to improve their ADR actually helps these things in the long haul. Like, because as your point is, it might be you need to focus on the low performers, bring them up to the middle, but most of the initiatives are just to try to move everyone up. Um, yep. Anyway, yep. but we'll yep. put that as, yeah, go ahead. Um, no, I agree. I agree with you. So here's one question I have for you, which I, which I was curious about. Um, why did you choose to do colonoscopy versus no screening rather than colonoscopy versus FOBT or uh, flex sig? Um, what was the thinking around that decision? Well, that's a very, it's a very good question. Nobody has asked that question in the last day. So I applaud you for that. Uh, the answer is very simple. We didn't have the money for a third arm. Ah, I see. We would love to have a third arm. We would love to have a fit arm. Um, for example, uh, we didn't have the money because that's what costs the money, the, the interventions, you know, we but why the funding? I, so, I, okay, I get that. But uh, why? And the control arm is not doing nothing rather than one of these mm -hmm. other things. Why not just a comparison? Is colonoscopy better than sigmoidoscopy? We didn't want that. We were always very clear that we wanted the no screening option because yes. we wanted to understand that that jump, if there is any, from nothing to something. And the something here was colonoscopy. We were I interested see. in that. Uh, I we would like to have the thing in the middle, but we just didn't have the funding. And I guess maybe to help, um, I, I mean, I, I actually think it's a it's brilliant the way you did it. And, um, and perhaps you actually were, you might be the last person on earth that's going to be able to do, you know, truly against nothing because that's the, the reality of most Western industrialized nations is that they're all vigorously screening. I cannot imagine doing this study in the United States and not getting, you'll get 20% versus 30% to be honest, you know, you'll get, yeah. you'll get d dis incredible contamination. Uh, in, in fact, yeah. so much, there'll be so little Delta, you won't be able to tell much. Um, well, we will see what, uh, Doug Robertson and Dave Lieberman and many of these people do with, um, with fit versus colonoscopy and the ongoing studies we'll find out. Um, yes. but back to this, I want to, I'm kind of curious about your thoughts in general on the colorectal cancer screening landscape. What do you think of the original FOBT studies? What do you think about Flexig? These do both have randomized controlled trials and meta-analyses showing a reduction in disease specific death. At least Flexig, in your own journal, in the Annals of Internal Medicine, you all have published a corrected meta-analytic estimate of all-cause mortality. And when you separate, um, uh, I believe it was the, a, a Nor another Norwegian study. No, no, a UK study. Yes. Um, you, you, you separate for Simpson's paradox. You correct, you know. Um, yes. uh, okay, so, but these are older studies. And, and, you know, the population is very different. We're fatter than we were. I don't know what happened to our fiber intake. We don't smoke as much. Um, you know, so how do you, how do you view though, that data in the modern age? What do you think of FOBT and, and flexing in the modern age? Yeah, that's a very good question. So let's start with a more simple answer, which is flexing, a sigmoidoscopy. As you said, we just published uh, on Tuesday, two days ago, um, a, a pooled analysis of the four randomized trials that are available, a uh, big data set with, uh, I think, 600,000 people altogether, 300,000 in the screening group. Um, with, with an effect, with the benefit of, of flexible sigmoidoscopy, which, which was about 25%, for instance, and about uh, uh, a little less, 20% uh, for, for mortality, cost-specific mortality. Now, I think those data are very interesting. They are valid. They are a very high quality of evidence, and I think they should influence um, policy and decision-making. Uh, there's one thing, although, that me... You know, I have done a lot of flexible sigmoidoscopies uh, 15 years ago in that one trial that is part of that new pooled analysis, which is also a Norwegian trial called NORCAP, not Nordic, but NORCAP. Um, I don't like to do sigmoidoscopies for the simple reason it's um, dirty. You know, people are cleaned with an enema. An enema means that you clean the lower, lower part of the bowel and then you go in with your scope you pump up with uh carbon dioxide and then if you are unlucky you see that wall of feces coming towards you in the sigmoid colon <laughs> yeah and people starting to i get i get nervous because i don't see anything and people starting to get nervous because they feel the need to go to the restroom <laughs> yeah. so it's um it's um that doesn't happen in everybody 
but it happens in I think too many people to to for me right now to seriously consider to go back to Plexic. Although the concept is appealing because it's shorter, you could do it with an anima. There's no sedation. Well, we don't sedate for colonoscopy either, but for the US, there's no sedation. Um, um, but it's it's a it's a dirty business, and we have now the bowel cleansing for colonoscopy. Although it's you know it's more cumbersome, you start the day before everything. It's so much cleaner to do colonoscopy, uh, and yeah. So so from the from, from the evidence part, the quality of the evidence part, I really like Flexic. From the like practical part, uh, I'm not sure if we should go back to that. So it's okay. a dilemma, and I don't have a solution for that. And what about FIT and FOBT? Yeah, FOB, the, FOB, the old FOBT trials, you know, very good trials, solid, a lot of people in the trials, however old, very old now, from the 80s. Um, and um, well, I don't think the biology of polyps and colon cancer has changed. I don't think there's anything different now as, as compared to in the 1980s. So that's not a, an argument. However, um, as you said, risk structures have changed, and and the BMI is higher, and all that. Um, but the main the main problem with the FOBT as tested is that's an old test. It was also cumbersome to do. You had to do three samples for each of the tests. So I think that test, that old test, the GIAG is outdated, uh, and I think for a, for a good reason. However, then you go to the newer version, which is the FIT, which is more attractive. It's a little bit um, more specific. All, it can also be more sensitive, but it's it's really about the cutoff. But that's a beauty. You can choose your cutoff as you like. You couldn't do that with the old FOBT. And it only requires one sample, one feces, one stool sample. Uh, and then the question becomes, okay, can, I, can we transfer the evidence of the effect, of the benefit from the FOBT trials to the newer FIT programs where we don't have randomized trials? There's no evidence from randomized trials for FIT. Right. Uh, and usually I don't like extrapolations from one test to right. another. Me too. Uh, but for this one, maybe we should do a little exception. Maybe it's not like the highest quality for me for fit because I would love, love to have an, uh, an OCT for fit. Uh, but except that the test, the fit test is reasonably similar to FOBT. Uh, so, so I would say, yeah, you know, I, I, I can buy that argument. Then, however, the question is, so how good is it fit? I mean, FOBT, it was like 18, 18% mortality uh, yeah, reduction. Um, reduction, no reduction in incidence. I think the incidence reduction, if there is one, is a more interesting endpoint uh, than just only mortality uh, for a number of reasons. We can talk about that if you like. Yeah. So the question is, is it similar to FOBT? Is it higher? How much higher is it? Is there also an effect on incidence in addition to mortality? I think nobody knows. That's really That well again put. makes it difficult to do guidelines and recommendations. How can you do that if you don't really know how, how large the effect is? <laughs> and um, yeah, that's really well said. I mean, I think some people see that the colorectal cancer reduction in FOBT trials is so modest, they wonder if all FOBT is doing is randomly triggering colonoscopy. Like you might as well just flip a coin, you know, and then, you know, uh, and that's really what FOBT is serving as. But I guess yes. I have one thought for you about the temporal change from the 1980s to today. I agree with you. There's no difference in the biology of colon cancer. And I don't see anything in how we eat or our lifestyle that would change the nature of the disease. But right. I do think there are differences in, 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 in two domains. One, the propensity for a person to say there's something different down there. And I think back in the 1980s, and you know, we're talking about my parents and maybe my grandparents' generation, um, you know, there are a lot of pe men who would have a bloody bowel movement and they'd say, that's life. You got to suck it up and get back to work and keep your sure. mouth shut. Don't tell anybody about that. Uh, now, I think, you know, men are more comfortable saying, or and women, that something's, something is problematic. I feel something. I feel fullness on my, on my side and my stools are harder to get out and they're changing shape and the color is different, et cetera. And, 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 and that will, I think, erode the potential upside. And then the other thing I think is different is the quality of the surgery for colorectal cancer has gone through the roof better. Good point. Uh, um, Good point. And, and um, so much so that there's all this stage migration. I mean, they're cutting out more yes. nodes than ever before. And the pathologist actually knows how to look through the nodes now. Back in the day, they didn't, you know. Um, and, and the quality of adjuvant therapy has gotten better. And, and those two forces, I think, may make it such that the 1980s data is less relevant to 2022. 
in the absence of a biologic difference of disease. I agree. I agree. And that would affect both some of the relative effects that you see, but but in addition, I think that's more important, and we may going to go into it with regard to the new results of the Nordic trial, the absolute um, risk, and then also the absolute risk reduction. I mean, one of the features that I think is most interesting in the study that we just published is that very low absolute risk of colorectal cancer mortality. Yes. It was it was 0.3% in the control group, which is like the background, you know, mortality in the population. That is lower than we had expected. And that I think is a reflection of what you just said, improved treatment, both on the surgical side and the and on the oncological side, which is great for patients. I mean, it's good news. You know, case fatality has dropped from 60 to 30. However, it makes it much more difficult to um, for screening yes. uh, to have a, to have an effect that people find interesting. There's uh, just as an aside. There's a whole literature now that all of the adjuvant therapy studies that basically justify the use of chemo for stage three, but not two. Um, all of those studies were done in an era with bad surgery, uh, or bad surgery, I mean relatively. And uh, many, uh, I think, uh, very thoughtful doctors are writing that the absolute benefits of that chemo have diminished over time as we have been more appropriate staging. Um, yeah. And then the other, uh, okay, but I want to get into. Um, the trial, and then, I mean, the other things I want to talk about are, you've alluded to, that colorectal cancer screening might not improve mortality, but it might improve how many hemicolectomies we do, how many people yeah. get chemotherapy, and that's an important endpoint, and that's the endpoint about incidents we can talk a little bit more about. Um, and so I, maybe for the listener's sake, we should talk about what you actually found, the raw results, the per-protocol results. I have a question for you there. And then maybe instrumental variable results, which I've calculated, so we can talk about these things. Okay, so sure. why don't you tell 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 listeners what 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 were what did you find in terms of colorectal cancer death and all cause death and incidence? Let's go through them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's start with incidence first. So, in the effect on incidence, then we talk about the intention to screen or intention to treat uh, would be the more general term analysis first, because that's the that's the high quality, the primary analysis in every randomized trial. Um, so um, the um, the effect on um, on colorectal cancer incidence was 18%, so with a risk ratio of 0.82. And if you want to translate that to absolute risk, which I think is the more important, you know, measure, um, at least when I talk to patients. So um, so uh, in the control group, the, the risk of getting colon cancer throughout the 10 year was 1.2%, 1.2%, and then. Uh, if you were randomized to screening, uh, it was reduced to 0.98%. So the absolute risk reduction was 0.22%. Uh, About one quarter of one percentage point. True. Yes. And I think another interesting thing is that, just to point out, which is um, which is that uh, even though you get colonoscopy correct, you know, correctly, there's still cancer that comes. I mean, I think people forget that there's a lot of interval cancer. Yeah. Yes. You know, I mean. You know, you reduce the risk by about twenty percent. That means the other eighty are not yeah. reduced. You still yeah. people still get cancer after colonoscopy. Yes, and I think on your podcast the other day, there was a, a, a colleague, you know, a colleague colonoscopist, and he said that you know none of my patients get cancer after colonoscopy. I mean, that's and I could say that of my patients as well, just from thinking, you know, thinking back. I mean, first of all, that's not true. Second of all, it's not a very good argument. Yeah, and um, uh, <laughs> I did call him a, a GI apologist. Uh, he's actually not a colonoscopist. He's just a, he's just an apologist. Okay, no, but uh, okay. but you're you're right. I mean, you know, we have to separate. I think the anecdotal from the data. The data is clear. You know, you still get you know uh, you get you get eighty yeah. percent of the colon cancer. And um, as an oncologist, I guess you know I've had many people, unfortunately, who come see me with metastatic cancer who got all their colonoscopies, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's just the nature of the beast. Okay, so that's yeah. the incidence argument. Now let me ask you that the tougher question it's not reported in the manuscript but are you able to tell me that reduction in incidence how many fewer hemicolectomy colectomy adjuvant chemo is a result of that because sometimes um you know sometimes the cancer is actually entirely in the head of the polyp and they snare it and it's a cancer averted but it actually wasn't going to require a big surgery or anything at all anyway um and, and sometimes yes. it's a sessile cancer so how many actual procedures are changed do we know it's hard to know so this is one of the things that we will look into okay. uh, forthcoming. So I don't know, I don't have that number yet. 
Uh, we haven't reported it. Uh, we will wait with these kinds of analysis. There's also things like quality of life and, and a number of other stuff that we would like to look in, will look, in, look into. We've decided in the group uh, that we will wait uh, with that until after the next update of the main endpoints, which will be in two years, uh, because we don't we, we want to have more events to do these kind of of, of nitty gritty detailed analysis. Fair, fair. Okay, and tell us about colorectal cancer death. Very simple, no effect in the intention to treat analysis. Uh, uh, Ten percent, which was not significant, so no effect. That's I think the the, the main message, um, which is our primary endpoint. That's what we powered the study for. Uh, I mean, the power is for 15 years, so we're still early, but 10 year is the uh, recommended screening interval. So I think that 10 year number is important for people. Uh, and there is no effect. And let's talk about all cause mortality. And just 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 to reemphasize yeah, yeah. that for 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 your listeners, the absolute risk of dying from colon cancer was was 0.3%, 0.3%. I, I would consider that as very low. Zero point disease. 0 0.28, 0 0.31, statistically the yes. same. Yeah, but yes. very low. Yes. In other words, three, three tenths of one percentage point is a risk of dying with colon yes. cancer over a decade. And I want to, yes. I think it's, I'm glad you put the all cause mortality and, because I want to show the, it against the backdrop. Yeah. True. Sure. So, in yeah. other words, you can flip that around and say, well, you know, the, the chance of not getting colon cancer uh, over 10 years of the folks who were in the study, which is the, which is the general population of, in these countries is 90.7% that you don't get, don't die of the disease, which is pretty high. Uh, so if you think of, and I know that you are interested in all cause mortality, we're going to get to that in a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you think of, you know, more philosophically, you know, what of all the diseases in the world that I can die of, what, what should I focus on? What, where, where should my target by preference be to do something about maybe this one is not, is not very high on my priority list. Yes, I, I, I completely see that. And, um, and then the other thing I want to make clear from an individual point of view, if I get a colonoscopy and you do something and remove something, and then I, you know, uh, that cancer was never going to kill me anyway, you know, I wasn't helped. Yeah. If I get colonoscopy and, and you do like clip a big polyp that was going to be cancer in 10 years, but I get leukemia next year and die, I wasn't helped. It's only the person who like was going to have died of the colon cancer, but didn't die of the colon cancer as a result of the procedure who is helped. And so, you know, there's both the True. over treatment and, True. you know, yeah, the futile treatment. Um, True. But yeah, but to be balanced, yes. you know, between the two of us, because we are, we think very similar about these things, but to be balanced. So if, if again, more kind of a philosophical thinking, yes. so we all die at the end, right? That's, you know, that's, that's nature. And that's hundred, that's, 100 uh, <laughs> yeah. certainty that we all die and we die of something so we die of one thing or maybe two together but there's something that gets to put on our death certificate so if i think of it colorectal cancer is probably of all the diseases that are out there and i'm going to be dying of one you too um colorectal cancer is probably not a disease that i would prefer to die from because, you know, together with many other cancers, it's not a fun disease to have. It's not a fun disease to die from. Metastatic colon cancer is not a good thing. Um, so, so if I could choose or I could, you know, get a, take away the risk of, of a disease, I would like with the, you know, it depends on the on what the burden is and the, and the, and the complications, and everything, but if, if somebody says, well, you can take away that risk of colon cancer, but you will die of something else, probably at the same time, but you can take that away, I would probably say, yeah, that, you know, I would be interested in that. So what's what's my buy-in for that? Because it's not, a, it's not a fun disease to have. I totally, I totally agree with you. You know, it's actually an interesting and entirely distinct philosophical question, which is if we took a thousand doctors and surveyed them with a list of different causes of death and asked them to sort them by what they would most want to not die from and see if it correlates with specialty, et cetera. Um, because mm. I'll be honest with you, um, yeah. as a cancer doctor, I think dying from colon cancer is often unpleasant. And, you know, I, I agree with everything you say. But just off the top of my mind, the things that I think are even, you know, I can think of things that are worse and I think they're rather, you know, so, and the ones I think are worse are sometimes like head and neck cancer where you can get like, um, uh, sure. you know, uh, that's not, and, and also leukemia, I think is bad because in the year before you're dead, um, they're just going to keep you in the hospital for like the most of the time. And at least colon cancer, it's like, oh, okay. So, but it's a very interesting philosophical question. And, and I think yeah. it's good to be balanced. And obviously, you know, and the other nice thing about it is 
not all cancers you can see and screen for. You can't go screen. We have not yet found a way to screen for pancreas because you can't go and look at the pancreas. You can look exactly. here. So maybe that's another reason why, you know, we have been interested it in it. Yeah. Um, it is. It is. It let's is. talk about so all, all cause, cause death. Yeah. All, yeah, all cause death, no difference. No, no difference. difference. About 11% of the people who we randomized 10 years ago have died until today. And there's no difference between the two randomized groups. And that so one thing that jumped at me, 11% is that's not trivial risk of 10 year death. I mean, if you told me I have an 11% 10 year risk of death, I, I might start cutting back at hours at work. You know, I mean, that's real. Yeah, it's, yeah. 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 And it's, it's a little higher than we expected, but not a lot higher. Mm. Uh, there's a little difference between the countries. There's a higher all cause death rate in Poland as compared to the Scandinavian countries. But that is also expected because the life expectancy is a little shorter in Poland as compared to um, Norway and Sweden. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it totally reflects the, the, the population in the countries. Um, and did COVID affect it in the last year? Maybe bumped it up a little bit? No, no yeah, you know, over here, I mean, we didn't have we didn't have those pikes that those peaks that you had in the U.S. I see. COVID was much milder. No, the disease was not was not much milder. The disease is the same, uh, but the effects were milder over here as compared to the U.S. for reasons that we can talk about another podcast. That's another time. Yeah, <laughs> let's talk about per protocol, the per protocol yes. analysis, which takes the people compliant with screening that forty two percent. And covariate matches them, matches them to a subset of the control arm that's covariate adjusted. That mm. shows a 0.15% risk of death in the screened arm and a 0.3, which is your sort of the, the colorectal cancer death that you've been quoting. Um, what are your thoughts on this analysis? Is this helpful? Mm. Good question if it's helpful. I think it puts some of the people at ease that are my friends in the in the GI or endoscopy community, if they want to frame it that way. Uh, clearly, the per protocol is with regard of quality of the evidence or trustworthiness. Some people call it. It's much inferior to what we just talked about, the intention to screen. Uh, so I don't value it as high as all, at all as as the intention to screen. However, there is this argument, and I think it's a valid argument that, look, you know, only 42% accepted the invitation and had a colonoscopy, which is lower than, let's say, 95, which you would find in a drug trial, or 90 or 85. And, and for that reason, we also did this because we wanted to, we wanted to um, explore all the possibilities that are in the data set, and we wanted to um, make it transparent to everybody. Now, for me, the take-home message is that 50% estimate that you just quoted is the highest estimate of any analysis that we got. We ran two different protocol analysis, two different that. methodologies. Uh, and they, for instance, they were very similar in their effect estimate, uh, about 30%. For, for, for mortality, they were not so similar. There was one with 28% reduction, the other one with 50. I think the 50 is the highest you could expect, um, you know, with the perfect compliance with everybody comes in and you have a methodology that is the way it is, um, this is the maximum effect you can expect, 50%, so half. You cut that in half, that mortality, which is, um, I think, if you think a bit of all the screening tests that are out there for any cancer, I think that's a great number. However, it's much, much smaller than what, my people, my the GI community has been promising in the U.S. for the last 15 years, which is like 80, 90. Uh, we are not there at all. I think 50, if it's 50, I'm not sure if it's 50. I think it's lower, but if it's 50, it's credible, but it's not the magic bullet. Was the per-protocol analysis in the initial version of the manuscript? Yes, it was. And we have it in the protocol. So it, it was clearly written and we have... Um, you know, one of the world leaders in pre-protocol analysis, Miguel Hernan, uh, in the team, he was, he has been with us from the beginning. He's a good friend. And of course, you know, if, if anybody can do this the, the best way, uh, with all the caveats, you know, which are in there, then then Miguel's team are all these people. Uh, and so I, I trust what he does and I trust uh, what, what he can do with the data uh, but both we and he is clear about that this is per protocol with all the things attached. You are in that observational study setting. Uh, you are back there where, where you know, the other studies are. 
uh, which is which is not where we want to be with the trial because the, the beauty is that we can do intentional treat, which is unbiased by by design. Um, so yeah, you can That's take away from 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 that what you want. That's one thing I tell the American doctors, which the, which is that um, if you put all your faith in per protocol, then you know what you never you don't need to randomize because I could go to an insurance database and do a per protocol tomorrow. The whole purpose of the randomization was to avoid this thing that we have to do on the back end. Um, and then the other thing I'd say is, and you know, I am an admirer of Miguel Hernan and I read his book and um, it's not, I think not only is he taking something complicated, he makes it easy for you to understand, which is a yes, skill sure. beyond that. Um, yes. And his most famous claim to fame for observational methods to approximate randomized controlled trials was, of course, the Women's Health Initiative and Nurses Health Study about hormone therapy. And he did a masterful job of showing that had you analyzed nurses' health in a target trial framework, you would recapitulate WHI. Recently, the US FDA has a contract with Sebastian Schneidelweiss and colleagues at um, Harvard, and they use the target trial framework for 100 consecutive randomized controlled trials to see what fraction they could actually match and they're at 50%. And so what I want to say is, you know, it's the truth about observational studies. They, they, can, be, they can be right, they can be wrong, but they're right 50% of the time. And that's why we need the randomized studies, because it's, it's hard to recapitulate randomization, um, any method. It is. Okay. It is. And we yeah. should always point out, per protocol is, it, there is always bias in per protocol analysis, regardless how good you are, uh, regardless how good Miguel's methods are, which are good, it's not you know, it's it's not up there where the ITT is. It will never will be. Now, I want to ask you, um, I have a lot more to talk about the trial, but I want to ask you if you think this is a salient distinction, which is, let's say I am the governor of, or I'm the, I'm the president of a country that has no colorectal cancer screening, and I have all this money to try to make my population better off, and I come to you, Michael Brethauer, and I say, um, Professor, what should I do with this billion dollars to make my people better off? And then the second person is comes to you is, I am a 50-year-old man. I'm just a regular old guy. I don't have too many medical problems. And I come to you, Michael Brethauer, saying, I want to live as long as possible. What should I do? So how do you counsel the, the government official? How do you counsel the individual based on the results of your study and, and the totality of the landscape? Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think the first one is more difficult than the second one. So let's talk about, let's talk about the patient first or the individual mm -hmm. who comes to me. Uh, so what I would do, and I what I do uh, when I have the time, and I usually try to take that those two minutes. What I do is, I um, talk about three things. I talk about benefits, I talk about harms, and I talk about uh, 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 values and preferences of that individual. And it certainly would help me if I know that individual better. Um, but so I start with the benefits. I always talk about absolute risk of disease first. So your risk, and there are good calculators out there. So 50 year old male, I, we would go in and, and take that calculator that I use from the UK and you can plot in age and sex and smoking and little, you know, four or five variables. And you will get, we, we will get a 15 year risk or 10 year risk if you like. Of colorectal cancer was, death. Of colorectal cancer, you can do incidence and death, whatever okay. you like. And let's say let's say we do instance just for the you know just for the sake of the example and and it would come out at about one and a half two percent for that 50 year old male and i would say look this is your risk of getting the disease so you get an understanding how large the problem is okay and some people say oh it's only one percent i don't care you know don't talk to me okay this conversation is over i don't think about it values and preferences you know, you know um, but if, if that doesn't come, I would say, okay, here's your risk, 1.5% if it's that. Now, with screening, for example, colonoscopy, and I, I know that we found 20% risk reduction. So let's say you can go, if you do a colonoscopy, you can go from 1.5 to 1.2 or 1.3, which is about 20% risk reduction. And then I would explain this gentleman what a colonoscopy entails. So you have to clean to be at home, you have to sit on the toilet, you know, the colonoscopy is, do, is done like this, it takes, you know, 30 minutes, and after that you have to recover and then you go home. Your risk of, of bleeding is 0.13% uh, and you have a very, very small uh, risk of perforation. I would explain what the perforation is in a few words. Um, and then I think this person has all the information he or she needs to make a conscious decision. And then uh, you can see some people say, oh, don't bother, you know, this is so small. 
both the risk I come in with and then the risk reduction, I don't care. Other people say, oh, okay, I, you know, I'm a little concerned and I know an aunt who had colon cancer and it was terrible and, you know, and she suffered. So I want to do it. Okay. Then you do it. So um, that's what I do with people. I give them all the numbers and then they can make a conscious decision. Some For some people, it's easy to make that decision. For some people, it's difficult and it takes a little lo longer. Um, and then going to the health minister, that's, you know, that guy who has all the money and decides. What I would tell this guy is two things. Number one, you have to think about, and he, this guy also needs the numbers I just talked about for his or her population. Number one is you have to think if there is other things that you would like to do where there is a, a larger benefit. Uh, for the money you have. And I wouldn't know because I only focus about this, you know, you asked me about this one, but I guess there would be other things. Number two, this is important. If this guy says, no, no, we have some money for this. Okay, offer it, have a system for it, offer it so people can get it if they want it. Those folks that we have informed the way I, I told you, offer it, but don't nudge people go out there and tell everybody has to have it. You're an idiot if you don't have it. You know, like the old mammography advertisement, you know, there was a paper in Legion some years ago, you know, if you haven't had your, your breast exam, you have, you know, you have a problem. Yeah. Um, that's not the way. The, to the line is, if you, have, um, so, if, if, a, if a woman hasn't had a mammogram, she needs more than her breasts examined by the American Cancer Society yes, in the newspaper. Yes. And I think the paper is by yes. Barry, Barry Kramer, New England Journal. Great guy, Barry Kramer yes. from NCI. Yeah, go on. Yes, yes. don't pressure so people. Don't, don't push nudge. on it. Don't yeah. don't pressure people. The offers out there. If people are coming, fine. If they don't, perfectly fine as well. I think that's and that's that would be a big step. We could still have oh. the offer. You know, health insurance could still pay for it for the folks who want it, but just go away from that blah blah and that nudging and that you know all the you know what I mean. I think I think we need to get away from that. That's really beautifully said, and uh, I'm probably going to try to snip this video and, and show it to people because I think it's that's the difference between Europe and America so profoundly. Mm -hmm. Not only do we, I've never seen anyone counsel anyone about any of the numbers, the magnitude of benefit. I mean, that's not even in, in our vocabulary. It is basically, first of all, you're 45, you should get it. By the way, the 40, we could have a whole dialogue on 50 to 45 and the model building that led to that which yeah. I'm very critical of and I published on that because I think you need you, we should be very careful with screening that we stick to the randomized evidence uh, and I that agree. doesn't okay so so that's a separate issue but in the US they just offer it the second thing is so many doctors are literally incentivized if your panel of patients doesn't have 80% 90% you're a bad doctor I'm going to take away 10% of your pay the moment you do that there is no informed consent you can't even have that conversation in the US you have to force them to do it uh, whether they want it or not um, and so I think it would That's be a, a crazy yeah. thing, a crazy thing to incentivize a health system or a healthcare worker or a practice to get more money if their participation leaning is high as they do in the U.S. for mammography. Yes. For example, maybe also for colon cancer. That's, and col that's, yes, and colon cancer. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, I think it's absolutely crazy and disturbing. And um you know, it's not only is it crazy, 20 years from now, there'll be a New England Journal article written about how could we have ever done that? Just like we look at that ad that says a woman is crazy for not getting married. How could we ever have done that? It'll be the same thing. How could we have incentivized people for such a preference sensitive decision to cudgel people? And Michael, I have to say, uh, uh, even though the colonoscopy bothers me, in my mind, the thing that bothers me the most is the way we pressure um, current smokers to do CT screening for lung cancer. I mean, I'm talking to people, this guy's a mechanic, he smokes two pack a day, he works on his car, you know, um, he's like, just wants to live his life in peace. They bring him in, they scan him, they find all these nodules, and then he's on this scan train. Every three months, he's getting scanned. Yes. They biopsy, biopsy, drop a lung, put a chest tube in, this biopsy is positive, they cut it out, they give him adjuvant chemo, then the other one comes back positive, they cut it out, they ask me, give him adjuvant again. I say, where's the data to keep giving adjuvant over and over? He already had chemo in the past, he's got a second, I have to give it again. 
again? That doesn't fit any trial, you know? And so now I'm like, I took this guy who just wanted to be a mechanic and smoke some cigarettes, he's 75, just wants to enjoy life, and now suddenly I've given him chemo for 12 months, and he's been out all these cuts, and, and this is, who knows how much of his incidents? Okay, so that really bothers me. Um, the government- No, we are talking yeah. about, you know, we're talking yeah. about the premium screening stuff here. We talk about colon cancer screening. This is, this is you know, if somebody asks me, so what of all the cancer screening tests, you know, of all the cancers that are that where screening is offered for, should I think to attend to? I would say colon. Yes, me all too. The other yeah. ones are worse. So Absolutely. we, you know, yeah, we're talking about the premium, and still we have a lot of concerns. Yeah, I agree. Now the other thing I want to help listeners think about is, and I think there is this conception, particularly in America, that you know colonoscopy is has no harms; it's not a big deal. And I know you have to you have to go after this. How's your time? A few minutes? A few minutes, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I have maybe... another meeting in 15 minutes. Okay. So we'll wrap up. So I guess um, talk about, talk about and, and maybe put it in context. I'll come back to that flexing. You know, your point was that it can be very filthy when you go in there. I, I, don't, I, I don't know, but I don't doubt that that's true. The one or two times I've actually shadowed them doing it, you know, I've had experiences like that. But I guess one interesting thing is despite that caveat, they were able to show benefits in randomized studies, so they must have gotten a lot of them done well. Um, oh, yeah. But so, how do you counsel somebody about? And then the other point I want to make it clear for listeners in the U.S. is you don't have to have sedation for flexig, but if you're very anxious, they will allow you to do. I mean, it's not like it's prohibited. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's not. There's not. But in but in the in Europe, you can do so many in a row uh, if they're unsedate. You just go quickly, um, and that's an advantage yeah, of a screening. Eighteen, eighteen every day. It's like six a day? Mm. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you should know that some hospitals in the U.S. have turned colonoscopy into a mill. I mean, they just have all these rooms, and the people is ready, and the anesthesia is moving, and then the doctor goes and does one, yes. does one, does one. Um, yes. And it's lucrative. Yes. I mean, millions of dollars a year per practitioner. Of course. Um, but let's talk about how would you counsel... Um, you talked about the individual counseling about colonoscopy. What if the individual said, hey, uh, Dr. Professor Brett Hauer, I really want fit or I really want flex sig. Um, and, what are, and, and, then, and then the other thing I want you to comment on is what's the downside of drinking the prep? Um, and in your study, you found zero perforation. So can you talk about that too as well? Yeah. Yeah. So with regard to the complications uh, for colonoscopy, um, there are some. I think the risk is low. That's what I would, I would consider it low. I would still give people the number, and there are mainly the two that we talked about: perforation and bleeding. Uh, the bleeding is, as we found in the trial, and this is consistent with other literature. It's about, you know, a zero point one, uh, maybe zero point two percent. Most of these bleedings, they're not like, you know, like cerebral hemorrhages. They're not like ulcer bleedings where you get really, really sick. Um, most of these bleedings are stopped with another endoscopy or they're stopped later in the endoscopy. Uh, so I think it is a complication, but it's it's fixable and mm -hmm. the the rate is low. Perforation is even lower. However, we, as you know, probably, uh, and some people discussed it here after, after the study came out, that we did most of the colonoscopies in the trial unsedated. Uh, so people didn't get any sedation. And we do that over here. We we think we could do it well, and I think the numbers show it, although many of my colleagues in the U.S. think we are crazy to do it without sedation. Um, one of the good things with doing unsedated colonoscopy, in, in addition to that it takes you know too short a time for recovery and is much, much cheaper, is that it's impossible to perforate someone's colon uh, if you don't sedate oh, people. Of course. You know, you, you can push you can push the colon so hard. You know, the people will tell you, they will beat you. They will say <laughs> You're right. Yeah, you know, I didn't stop. think about that. I didn't think about that. You You're have right. to be more careful, much more careful on the way in. Uh so 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 that's one of the reasons why we didn't have a perforation, because we, we need to be careful because people are awake, you know. And they will tell and, us. And, and that's also painful. why you're, the U.S., we're going to, if you did the same study in the U.S., it would have a much higher complication rate because they'll be sedate and they'll be, and they'll be trying to do them faster. I mean, we got to get through. Yes. Yes. I, I don't think it's, you know, I, it's, it's not it's, high. It's one, know, in 10, one, in 10, yes. one in 10,000. Operations are rare. One in 10,000? Yeah. They are rare. They are rare. And most of these, some of these are just that you're pushing through the wall when, when a patient is heavily sedated with propofol. And you can do that and people do that. Uh, it's rare, but, but it's possible. 
uh, it's not possible if the patient is awake. It's not possible. I, you know, I've tried to push. You know, people tell you, <laughs> stop. Um, um, and and but the other part of the part of perforation is that if you remove big polyps, then sometimes you know you perforate. Sometimes there's a hole. Yeah. Um, these days we just use clips and we we yeah. we um, we fix the hole right away. But that's counts as a perforation as well. And then what do you tell people? I know you have to go. What do you tell people about fit? If I come to your office and say I just want to do fit. I think for fit, it's a little bit more difficult with regard to the to the benefits because, as we talked about, there are no randomized trials. So I wouldn't, I I, I don't know if I should say twenty percent, twenty five percent, or fifteen percent, uh, but I I I choose you know a number which is close to the what the FOBT trials showed. Okay. And I would say, look, this is for death, and for instance, I'm not sure if it reduces incidence because we are not, I mean, we are uncertain. Uh, so I would do the same thing, the same drill. I would give what I think the benefits are in numbers and then what the harms are in numbers. And then I would explain, and this is important for the fit, you have to come back every other year or every year if you live in the US. You know, this is not a one-time thing. You have to come back. If it's if you want this effect, you have to come back uh, every year, every other year for the next 20 years. So I really appreciate all your time. And I just wanna, I have one closing thought and I wanna leave you with a closing thought or anything that you think I should have asked you I didn't. And my closing thought is, um, you know, to me, cancer screening is very interesting. Um, uh, and, and there's something I see that's similar between cancer screening and a lot of what I do, which is prescribing very, very expensive chemotherapy drugs with very small benefits, if any, um, which is that in both cases, sometimes the evidence base is, even though it's something we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars in outlay per year, it's very difficult to get 50 million to do a study, which to me is like just crazy that a government would spend, you know, we, here's a trillion dollars in healthcare spending and, yes. uh, you know, there's no money to study what works, just pay for things, you know, like that's like, <laughs> like if you ran Xerox and you had that attitude, you, you go bankrupt. But, you know, yeah. that's one thing. And then the next thing I think is that, for instance, I often have somebody in my office and I think this person has metastatic lung cancer and it's so easy in the United States for me to get $25,000 worth of monthly drugs, $4,000 PET CT, but sometimes I just need somebody to go to this guy's house and help him do his laundry and help him go to the potty and help him, um, you know, get some food. And there's no yeah. money in the budget for that. Like, God right. help you. Right. And then I think about, like, how did society work so that money goes for these things and not those things. And it's like, these things make some rich people richer. And those things will not make rich people richer. They make a lot of middle-class people have jobs and things like that, like having a nurse's aid, but it doesn't make, a, it doesn't consolidate wealth. And so naturally the system encourages wealth consolidation. And then I come back to screening and I think, if I had to sit, look at, at that health minister looking at the population, what would I do with my money? Probably everything for perinatal, early childhood development, the, you know, the, with kids in school and all this stuff. And then like the last thing on my mind would be trying to avert, you know, cancer death in the elderly because it, there's so many different cancers. It's so hard. And if I were to screen, I'd screen for cardiovascular disease or something that's, you know, broader and I can, okay. Um, so I wonder. I agree. I agree. Okay. So that's why, you know, I was, I should have been born in Europe because I think that that's the, that's the American difference <laughs> is that we are so this way, that way. Is there anything I didn't ask you or last thoughts before you have to run? No, I, I, no I, I'm good. I think it was a pleasure to talk to you. I like, I like this a lot. Uh, and I think we got a lot out of it. I hope for, our, for your listeners as well. There is this thing with the disease and how bad they are to get them. And there yes. is a hierarchy there, as we talked about. So, so we should, we, and people, people value things differently. You yes. know, we, we're, not all, we're not all the same. And, 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 and so, so we have to, we have to pay attention to that after we have informed people about what their risk is and everything what we talked about. And, and, and some folks may say, well, you know, for me, it's still worth it. And then probably, okay, it's probably we should have the offer, uh, but we should wind it down from that level where we are now, where it's, where it's, where it costs a lot of money that we could spend for other things that just, as you said, to still an offer, but not do all the fuss about it. Professor Michael Brett Hauer, thank you. Wonderful study, seminal piece. It will be incredibly cited. Um, and uh, thanks for taking time. Thank you so much.